So here's the deal. 20 minute weeknight supper or elegant Saturday night main course to your next dinner party? Salmon, seared in brown butter with a caper and shallot sauce and a puree of watercress and sweet peas. It's springtime, baby. I wanna show you a couple of easy techniques uh, that I think are gonna make for a really delicious late spring, early summer dinner for you at home, but also pay attention to the, the engineering of the meal itself, those, those technical things that translate beyond just searing salmon. Once you sear salmon, you can sear chicken breasts. Once you learn this sauce that I'm gonna do with the salmon, you can serve it with anything. Um, once you start to work with the idea of enriched uh, vegetable purees, which we're making today with watercress and peas, you can do that with lots of other vegetables. And most importantly, I don't need to serve like a giant pound-sized baked potato with this meal. So um, we are just going to serve the vegetable puree with the salmon to try to make the main course lighter. If I'm cooking at home and the only thing we're eating is the fish and the vegetable, I may throw some roasted uh, potatoes, something crispy on the plate, maybe some uh, sweet potato dish. But if you're going to have a multi-course meal, keep that main dish lighter and smaller. So, all right, lecture is over. Um, first thing that we wanna do is we want to make our puree because our puree can hold, our fish really can't. So this water is coming to a boil. So I'm actually going to blanch my watercress first. Um, these thicker, larger stems, I'll pick through. I may do other things with them. Um, I keep pickling liquids uh, in my refrigerator, uh, both vinegar and uh, salt brine, so I can always throw those stems in there, uh, pickle them, and then serve them with grilled beef uh, in the Korean style, like uh, banchan. But I'm basically taking the tops of the watercress and those thinner stems, and I'm just going to place them into my almost simmering pan of water. Don't stick your fingers in boiling water at home. Use a, a spoon. You know, try not to use tongs for everything. Tongs tend to damage uh, food. In, in, in my later years as, as a chef, I've started to use uh, wooden utensils more and more and more. I like the feel of wood in my hand. Um, now these have only been in here for, gosh, I don't know, 25 seconds, but you can already see that they are cooking. And I don't want them to go much longer because I still want that peppery cress flavor. And the longer that the watercress cooks, the less of that peppery cress flavor that I get. So this is really just, yeah, that's almost exactly where I want it. And I'm just gonna scoop this out with my wand and load it into this small hand strainer. And let that rest. Now, this same water, right? Just watching here, it's about to come back to a simmer. I'm gonna add my frozen peas. Now, if you have fresh peas, you're gonna to have to blanch them until tender. If you're working with frozen peas, um, they're already ready to go. But they're a little al dente and they're frozen. So the hot water will help defrost them. And then you need to cook them for about 30 seconds, bring out a little bit more of their sweetness. I should say, by the way, I seasoned this water with a few teaspoons of kosher salt. And while that is cooking over there, I'm gonna add a little bit of elbow grease to my watercress. And I'm just pressing. And you can use a glove. You can use a back of a wooden spoon. This is hot. I've just been cooking for a long time, so I have no feeling in my lower extremities. And I don't wanna 
don't want to turn this to mush in my hands, but I want to make sure that I'm not going to dilute the intense vegetable flavor that we're going to have in this dish or water down the butter and cream that's going to go in here. And I, I do like the butter and cream that goes in here. So I'm just gently squeezing. We get a lot of water out of this. Set that aside because our next round of this is going to be with our peas. Now, the water here is about 200 degrees. So there's nothing wrong, just like with pasta. Taste your product. Oh, perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. They're hot, they're sweet, they're tender. Now, typically, I would just bring this whole thing over to the sink, but cooking for you guys here, I thought I would do this a little more forward facing. So yes, at this point you're done with the hot water so the whole thing can go over to the sink. And I'm just gonna let that sit, place this behind me. Grab my pan, place down to begin preheating for my salmon. Now the peas, I just wanna rock back and forth, make sure I get all the water out. Whoa, runaway peas. I'm just gonna put my peas into my food processor. Then I'm going to season my peas. A little bit of white pepper. Please remember, salt brings out flavors in food. Pepper adds its own unique flavor to food. Black pepper, white pepper, pink pepper, green pe green pepper grits all have different flavor profiles. I like white pepper. The other nice thing about the white pepper is you don't get those black flecks in this stunning green dish. Then we have our watercress. Now remember, you've just squeezed the heck out of it so that you don't get strands of stem and leaf sort of like pounding around in your food processor, spread them out. Um, this is a great example of why a food processor is not a blender. I mean, you can't use a blender for this because it's just gonna cake everything up, right? But a blender, and this is maybe where we can all make our fortune, I'll take investment money anytime. We need to make a food processor that has blades that are canted like a blender. So that when the food comes up the sides, it falls back into the middle and gets processed. That's a million dollar, that's a million dollar idea right there. Next thing we're gonna do. Add our creme fraiche. You can use sour cream. I prefer creme fraiche, it's richer. I think it has a more gentle flavor. Whoop. And our butter. And so that I'm not kicking around a lot of butter in there, I'm gonna break that up as well. So I've got my salt, my pepper, my creme fraiche, my butter, I'm really liking butter these days. I think it's, I think it's the pandemic. My butter addiction is redlining. And slam that on and just pulse it to start. Wow. 
Why do you pulse it to start? So you're not kicking food all over the place and you wind up with pats of butter stuck to the lid of your food processor. Now, next thing, take your spoon or spatula, run it around the edge, and scrape down the sides of your food processor, right? We talked before about the shape of the blades. This food processor, the blades are flat, and the walls of the vessel are straight, which, mean, which means it kicks food up, and it stays there. So you scrape those sides down, it. Mm, look at that. Beautiful. So, let's take our puree. And this is only going to take about eight or ten minutes on a low setting in a small pot on the stove. By the way, you can freeze, uh, you can refrigerate at this point. I've actually never tried freezing this. We have this beautiful puree. We're going to put this on our stove and let it warm up while we cook our salmon. No, doesn't need any salt at all. All right, so let's turn this burner on. Stick that over there. If you want to add some other flavors to that puree, I like it very simple like this. You really taste the watercress and the sweetness of the peas. And we have a lot of flavor in the sauce and the salmon, and salmon itself is a very strong fish. But if you want to add something in there, try mint or tarragon. Both work really nicely. If you're going to put tarragon in there, don't put tarragon in the sauce for the fish. Uh, but mint and peas is a classic combination. I encourage you to do that. The other thing, we were at the Asian market today. If you don't have watercress, uh, Chinese mustards work really well. Um, as does uh, shizo leaf, which is one of my favorite, favorite foods to cook with. And I may use some of this in, uh, when I plate our, uh, plate up our salmon. Yum. All right. So, uh, the salmon. Let's get down to business with that. Um, I have capers. They've been rinsed and drained. Whether you're using salt pack or vinegar pack, rinse them and drain them. If you're using salt pack, you have to hydrate them. Several changes of water over the course of about an hour and a half to get all that saltiness out. Vinegared ones uh, rinse out quicker. Just a change or two of water for a couple of minutes is all it takes. And then you taste the caper and you don't taste all of that vinegar. Um, I encourage you to juice your lemon or lemons, depends how much juice you're getting out of them. These are really juicy. I like to squeeze at will and then you just use a fork and take your seeds out. So there we have our lemon juice for this dish. Uh, tarragon. Just, I don't know, is it my favorite uh, herb? Maybe. I can put tarragon. I love licorice. I love all those anise flavors um, and tarragon has that in spades. 
I'm just stripping off the leaves and you might notice in a couple pieces here, up at the tip, I got those real loosey-goosey uh, tippy top stems. Those are fine. They have lots of flavor. And I'm just coarsely chopping them. Make sure you don't get those thick central stems in there. You'll be fine. There's my tarragon. And again, I'm going for something really coarsely chopped there because I want you to bite into pieces of uh, tarragon. Parsley, same deal. They did not have Italian parsley at the market. So I got conventional parsley, the curly. Shallot. Um, if you have onion, use that. If you have access to shallots, um, I started <laughs> using shallots in in almost everything. Um, I just love the flavor. Shallots and leeks are my two favorite uh, alliums. That's everything in that garlic and onion category. Um, and I'm just peeling these, getting rid of that sort of fibrous outer layer of paper. That was actually a good sized one. And with the shallots, I want to make sure that you're not biting down onto big pieces of shallot, but I'm also not getting into analysis paralysis about how small that is. But you want to mince these fairly fine. And if you need to run your knife back and forth and do one pass just to make sure, go ahead and do so. You can see from, I don't know, one and a half golf balls worth, you're gonna get several tablespoons of minced shallot. The bigger pieces, I would encourage you to slice in half and treat separately. And the reason there is knife safety. A round, roly-poly shallot, that's a surefire way that you're gonna cut yourself. So just cut it in half, cut it into batons, and then go against it the other way with your knife. Not only will you get a nice mince on it, but that flat side keeps it stable on your cutting board, so you're not gonna hurt yourself. There's always that one little piece. All right. Delicious. All right. Pepper. Salt. Some people like to add a little splash of white wine in this. By all means, go ahead. I'm gonna start this off with butter. If I'm making a butter sauce, I tend to go butter all the way when I'm pan frying my fish or seafood. If I wind up with brown butter in the pan, the uh, butter that I use at the end to emulsify the sauce will actually emulsify, emulsify the broken brown butter in there, and you just get a richer, nuttier tasting sauce. Um, some people like to start with olive oil, and that's fine if you want the olive oil flavor in the dish. In this case, I wouldn't object to the olive oil flavor in the dish, but I'm just gonna go with straight butter. And I'm gonna put a couple of slices here on my board, just so that they're at the ready. I can throw them in there. Some people, uh, love to get out lots of little bowls. I like to hold bowls for things like capers or lemon juice, um, but I gotta wipe my board down anyway. So I'm just gonna cut my stick of butter here 
and just place it right on my board. All right, so we have everything laid out. And now our salmon. All right, now, um, yes, I am in demonstration mode, but I usually do put my fish on a separate board, so I'm only washing one, right? Um, this is a side of salmon that came in this morning. It's lovely, it's fresh, but we need to deal with this. Now, these days, I kind of am in the mood to shop less cook more so i will get a side of salmon i can freeze pieces i can cut off the tail right away and use that for another purpose typically something like uh tartare or uh dice it and make a seafood salad like a ceviche or uh dice it and poach it um and cool it and make like a salmon salad and stir our puree is getting nice and warm. Starting to bubble around the edges there. Um, and this already came in with the pin bones removed. They missed one, so I'll take that piece out. Um, there's also a little bit of that shoulder fat that's there. This is the shoulder side or loin side, so I'm going to reserve that for another use. This is the the belly side, right? The fish swims this way. Um, this belly is fattier and thinner. Now I save my bellies because they are fattier, they freeze better. I save my bellies skin on, cutting them into pieces. And then these are my favorite things to throw onto the grill and then baste with a little bit of soy sauce, sake, and rock sugar reduction. Recipes on my website at andrewzimmer.com. These char up so beautifully. They're also great for kebabs and all kinds of things. So then I have this beautiful sort of central loin, right? There's the top loin here, which is everything above this little bone structure. And then there's the middle loin here. They have different textures. You can actually see those ribbons of fat in there that go in different directions. That's because of the way the muscles articulate themselves. Um, the, you can sort of cut down there and make logs of them. Um, it really depends on what you want to do with your uh, fish. Typically, what I will do is I will sort of square off my end. So I have this beautiful rectangle where the one, two, three, four, five, six portions of fish each one about the size of a deck of playing cards or hockey puck, four or five ounces of protein is going to, uh, well, it's gonna give me those six portions right there of that. It depends on how many guests I have. I could saute, well, for sure four in this pan. In a larger pan, I could saute all six portions, put it with a little bit of the puree and we're in great shape. Um, but I'm just gonna plate up uh, two plates for you uh, right now. So my, my decision making is how do I want to cut the salmon? I mean, you could take a cookie cutter and make rings for all I care. Um, some people like to do fun stuff like this. Remember, the skin is still on there, scales are off, and crispy salmon skin is delicious. Some people like to do um, a piece like this. Other people like to get fancy, you've probably seen this in restaurants, where you cut through the flesh down to the skin and then turn it, cut through, ooh, they left another bone in there. Um, and then you turn it and you actually have what looks like a lateral cut through the fish, uh, but is actually boneless, right? And that's sort of fun to do. Some people like to tie those and poach those. It's a lot of fun. Uh, different games that you can play with your fish. Um, I'm just going to go with two very conventional pieces of filet. Turn the 
this down, keep that warm. Uh, I'm going to season them. I'm going to put pepper in the sauce. I'm not gonna put pepper on there. Um, I just like the look of a clean crust of the fish. I don't want little black flecks all over there. And I don't like necessarily the taste of white pepper when it scorches. Uh, black pepper, when it scorches, doesn't get quite as bitter, bitter as white pepper does. Um, so we're just gonna raise the temperature. There's a lot of fat in salmon. So I don't need to worry about a lot of sticking in the pan as long as my pan has been preheated and I'm cooking with enough thermal momentum. Most American home cooks don't use bowls that are big enough. They don't use heat that's strong enough. They don't use, they just tend to go very small, which sort of confounds me. Um, so once it's hot, the best way to take, test that it's not going to stick is to actually draw your fish across the bottom of the pan. So if there's no sticking there, you can go ahead and lay that down. It means your pan is hot enough. And we're just gonna let that sear on that one side, what we call the show side, until it's got a nice brown crust on it. I'm gonna wash my hands, give me one sec. I've been stirring this. My puree is nice and hot. Get rid of those peas on the counter. Two very nice plates. See that nut brown butter that's forming there? I turn the heat down. I'm going to have plenty of heat in the pan to accomplish the the cooking of this dish in the six, seven minutes, and then the minute or so of resting while the sauce is made. Um, and I may actually build the sauce while the salmon is in there and let some of that liquid get inside the salmon and almost uh, poach it at the end in the butter sauce. Um, but that brown butter, I want to preserve that color. Right there is absolutely perfect. I don't need it to go uh, to uh, beurre noir or black butter. Right? right now we're at Bernoisette, brown butter. And you can lift up your salmon and see we have this beautiful crust. We're almost ready to flip the salmon over and let it start to crisp on the skin side. Now if I was making four, six portions in there, I would make the sauce afterwards. As it is right now, there's so much room around in this pan, I can actually start to sweat my shallots, my capers, my herbs, my lemon juice, maybe a little splash of wine, let it reduce around the salmon in a couple of minutes, uh, add my butter after I take my salmon out and plate that. That's beautiful. And we're just gonna let that skin get nice and crispy too. Now, uh, th th there's a, I, I love the flavor of raw salmon. I love the flavor of raw fish. In this dish, I'm, I'm actually looking for cooked salmon. <laughs> so I want this dish to have a blush to the center of it, but I want it to rest to that blush. So I'm gonna cook it to in between medium rare and medium and just let it rest for a while. So it's still super, super moist on the inside. We're not gonna cook it for so long that we see a lot of uh, white proteins begin to come out in different parts of the fish. We're still gonna uh, cook this to a uh, very thin, warm center and so it can rest the rest of the 
uh, way in terms of cooking. So I can see here on the sides, I don't know if you can see that. So you can see where the top down, that's cooked about a half inch down there. It's cooked about a half inch up the other way. It's only about an inch and a quarter thick that way. So it's now got that blush in the middle that we're talking about. So at that point, I can add my shallots. Why not? Let those cook in that brown butter. Mm. God, the smell of that is amazing. I'm going to add my capers. And I do want to let the shallots and capers cook in that brown butter. the volume of herb relative to this. This is a very herby sauce. Why? It's springtime. Come on. Now, I happen to have a bottle of wine lying around. Oftentimes people do. Someone had a glass of it. So we're going to use that one. I'm going to put a few tablespoons in, right? I just need enough sauce for these two Pieces, black pepper to the sauce because it's so good with wine and butter. Let that reduce. You know, we're not a restaurant here, but boy, is it nice to cook. By the way, white wine is reduced. It's nice to cook with an eye for plating. So I just am putting scoops a little off center. Super simple, just lean that across there. So I now have this whiny, lemony, herby. Integral pan sauce going that has that brown butter in there. And you can pull this from the heat. just emulsify that butter. Delicious. Sweet with the shallots. Sweet and creamy with the butter. Nice tartness from the lemon juice wine and capers. Great flavor from those herbs. And I like to put a little bit of that herb, shallot, and caper mixture on the top of the fish. And just let the sauce puddle around it. So there you have it. One of the easier, quicker, more elegant home cooked meals that you will ever have. You can do this in 20 minutes at home uh, on a weekday night, getting family meal out in a hurry, or it makes a very elegant entree as part of a multi-course meal. It's the pan-seared salmon with caper and shallots, uh, brown butter, white wine, and the spring pea and watercress puree. Oh, love that dish. I'm hungry, you know what? 
Let's make sure that it's oh perfectly cooked. Oh my god. You know what makes this is the sweet earthiness of the pea and watercress with the sharp acidity in the sauce with that crispy salmon. Mm. That's perfect. This is springtime on a plate. Enjoy it.